We have with us Ann Coulter, good friend, best-selling author, and moderate voice among those on the right, keeping everything calm and, and smooth all the time. Ann, how are you? Fine, thanks. Merry Christmas, Will Kirby. Merry Christmas to you. Hey, um, last last best-selling book in Trump in Trump we trust. Still e trust him. Awesome. E pluribus awesome. Uh, still feeling that way. Anything that he has done might have upset you, change your mind, or are you still happy? Every day is like Christmas in Trump's America. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got to tell you, um, as one who is skeptical uh, for a long time, I am extremely impressed with how he's conducted himself. Most of the people he's appointed, so a few question marks, but you get that with every president. You can't, you know, the only perfect candidate is you or me, right, Ann? I mean, everybody else has flaws. Well, I um, love Trump so much, I realize I'm doing what parents do with degenerate children. I keep, you know, they say, my kid's <laughs> fine. He's hanging around with a bad crowd. Um, uh, and I keep saying the same thing about Trump um, and the appointments I don't like. Up, oh, that's, that's a Michael Pence. Uh, Mike Pence or Ryan's previous appointment. Get them out of there. That's right. Get them out of there. That's right. No, it's uh, amazing. I just I wanted to uh, check in with you on a couple of things. One, um, John Kerry's speech this morning and the Obama administration decided not to veto this resolution on Israel. The rumors they collaborate with the Palestinians and the Venezuelans and the New Zealanders on doing this. Your thought, I mean, it seems like he's doing everything he can to mess things up and create problems before he leaves, like a little petulant child has been told he has to leave and doesn't want to, so he's trashing the room before he goes. Um, well, as I'm saying with everything these days, Trump will fix it. I think so, too. Uh, um, and I also think, I mean, part of, part of what I loved about, about Trump, and I think part of his appeal is um, that we've been caring an awful lot about the rest of the world, and that mm -hmm. seems to be the only preparation most of these Republicans went through to prepare to run for president of the United States of America. As I point right. out in my book, In Trump We Trust, memorizing you know the geography of Syria, that was all Rubio ever wanted to talk about. And Trump, uh, I mean, it's weird that it, it, it took so much effort. It took this massive, strong personality to, to rest politics from caring about the rest of the world while, while our own country falls apart. I wish America had as much of a um, self-preservation, or not America, obviously it does, but I wish pundits and politicians cared as much about preserving America as, as Israel politicians do about care about preserving Israel. Well, that's what Trump, Trump has given us. We want to talk oh. about... We want to talk about America for a while, and um, how about our two-state solution with Mexico? We need we need to, <laughs> we need to get back to that because um, yeah. those occupied <laughs> territories, not occupied yeah. territories. We took that land back in 1848, and we paid them for it. We, we paid them for it. Invasion now from people who who think it belongs to them. You know, we what a lot of people don't understand is we took it in a military conflict that they started. We won it militarily, and then we paid them for it. What other country, in conquers other territory with their military, then pays the people to lost the territory for the stuff we took by? I mean, no other and country does that. And then reinvade and pays them yes. again. With I did the math. I did the math. <laughs> and I figured that uh, what we paid for in 1848, plus inflation, plus the value of everything we've added, and look at San Diego, look at Tijuana, you'll understand what I mean. Look what we added and what they haven't. I figure it's around $8 trillion. And if they really want California for $8 trillion, I'd, I'd consider that. <laughs> right. <laughs> for $8 trillion, because we could pay off our national debt, they'd get California, and we might be better off. But anyway, no, I agree with you. This is um, Tom so, Cotton this morning. don't know if you saw it, but Tom Cotton had an op-ed in the New fantastic. York Times. Wasn't it? Oh, my Wasn't gosh. It? This is how Trump has changed the world. This is what I always loved about Tom Cotton, by the way, when he was running for the U.S. Senate. Yeah. Um, he was one of the strongest on immigration, and that was a very impressive win. He took out a very popular Democratic incumbent. That's right. Um, very hard to take out incumbents, and, and he That's did right. In fact, That's he may right. have been the only one that year to take out an incumbent. It's, it's extremely rare. And, and if you were following that campaign, he kept saying, 
because he actually, you know, is an Arkansan and would go and, and talk to the people, he said, the one thing people are talking the most about is immigration. Well, you would never know that from, from the pundits, from the media, um, from the politicians themselves. So he was very good on the issue. But I happened to notice um, <laughs> that when, when the U.S. Senate, Republicans led by Mitch McConnell, failed, broke their promise to block Obama's executive amnesty um, after the 2014 election, that debate was going on for about, in the U.S. Senate, Democrats were filibustering it, um, massively unpopular for, for Obama to, to engage in this wildly right. unpopular and unconstitutional move of just saying, well, I don't need Congress after all. I'm just going to grant amnesty. Um, the, the Republicans, it would have been a fantastic political issue for Republicans to run against any Democrat participating in that filibuster, but you could not get one word about it. I mean, it was like an underground railroad finding out what was happening with the filibuster. There was no mention of it in the media. And then, um, and I'm sure Tom Cotton was terrific, but, but didn't, didn't see him being interviewed all over TV. Um, wow. About a week later, he wrote that letter to the Iranian mullahs, and suddenly you couldn't turn on TV without seeing Tom Cotton. Tom Cotton so, I yeah, mean, that's unfortunately, right. the rewards for politicians have always been on caring about any country other than America. Tom Cotton um, is one of the exceptions, um, even before Trump came along. Yeah. And by the way, if anybody has not read it, it's New York Times today. And basically, Tom Cotton says the interests of American workers have to be the centerpiece of any immigration policy. And if business has to raise prices, increase wages and benefits, so be it because it benefits American workers. And I think he's right on on that. Yeah, he's um, fantastic. And, he is. and, you know, once we can, this is why, uh, as I describe in, in, in Trump We Trust, the media say, oh, yeah, sure, we'll talk about immigration. Go ahead. Um, here are the ground rules. You can't use the words illegal immigrants, amnesty, uh, sanctuary city. Um, and so on and so forth. But mostly the, the, the move of, of the elites, politicians, pundits, um, media, poli- um, everyone you can hear from, um, is just don't talk about immigration because they know it's right. not an argument they can win. And I think Tom Cotton's op-ed proves that. There, he, he quotes all of these um, you know, business restaurateurs and farmers saying, um, "No, no, we've got to have more, more, more immigrants from Mexico. We need more low-wage workers, or we can't, we can't get the work done without raising wages." And and Cotton says, "Yes, precisely. That's right. We want you to people. raise wages." And this is true. I mean, it can't be done. You can't ask a restaurateur to be an individual, you know, patriot and humanitarian. It's got to be across the board. No one gets to employ cheap foreign labor. You can't let your competitors have cheap foreign labor, but 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 blame the one restaurateur or the one the one farmer. That's why we needed a president like Trump to come along and say, "No, we're cutting off the spigot of cheap foreign labor, so that you will have to hire Americans and yep, raise their wages." 94 million Americans out of the workforce. That's the way to bring them back in. Incidentally, you will often hear, um, I'll I'll make the argument against myself and then respond to it, you will often hear in this context about how um, prices will go up and, oh, yes, well, an iPhone will cost um, $800 million unless we can have um, the Chinese build it for us. Um, At least in agriculture, and I suspect this is true in many other fields, the cost of labor is a tiny, tiny portion of the overall cost of the end product. Um, I mean, looking, for example, just at agriculture, it's fertilizer, it's machines, it's line, um, land, it's trucks, um, it's, it's the seeds and the plants. And the ultimate labor cost of any banana you buy or, or, or whatever, um, your cabbage or strawberry, the labor cost is only about 11% of the total cost. So prices aren't even going to go up that much. It's just the plutocrats and the employers have gotten fat and lazy, and it's easier to employ tractable employees. You won that argument, Ann. That was great. You argued with yourself <laughs> and you won. So you do that more often. Um, switching topics just a minute, I'm wondering if you – did you read what Harry Reid said in New York Magazine? He was interviewed. No, was but asked, I'd probably love to hear this. He was asked if he would support Joe Biden, who'd been thinking about running for president 2020. He was asked, would you support him? He said, quote, it depends on who's running. It appears we're going to have an old folks home. 
We've got Warren. She'll be 71. Biden will be 78. Bernie will be 79. So he basically said they've got an old folks home with the future of the Democratic Party. They don't have anybody under 70. And Hillary, of course, would be 73 if she wanted to run again. And I just thought that was somewhat of an odd admission from Reid, who's such a partisan, that their bench is all on Medicaid or Medicare. It is very striking how old the Democratic leadership is. Um, you know, it's funny how they they boast and and sneer about their very diverse, their diverse party, and we're so diverse. Yeah. Um, well, they're not very diverse at the top, Uh and and no, I think I think this is going to be it for for the white Democrats. Um, if 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 Obama Hillary has taught them anything, it's you better run a minority next time. Well, I'm off for Keith Ellison, chairman of the Democratic National Committee. I've started a committee. I'd like to ask you to join conservatives to support Ellison for chairman of the DNC because I think <laughs> well, you make a great choice. He has a completely insane background. Yes, he does. Um, he was a member of. I'm, I'm sure you know more details about this than I do. He was a member of a Farrakhan's group. But I will say he's 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 charismatic and charming, and you don't really find much of that in the Democratic right. Party these days. That's true. That's true. That is the plus. But I'm I'm hoping they keep moving left and don't learn the lessons from this one. Um, let me ask before we have to let you go. Let me ask what's up next for Ann Coulter? What's your next book? Do you have oh, one geez. planned? Can't I rest? I've no. <laughs> Two in and a you're row. an essential voice. We need I you out there. I wait a year and mull things over for a while. All right, so you got uh, 10 months. An emergency to get Trump elected. That's right. You got 10 months, right? Because the election was no, a month I ago. In the book. I, I think that In Trump We Trust is still the book of, of, think that's of last year, this year, next year. Um, it's okay. fun, it's short, and explains everything that happens so much better than people who will be rushing in after the election to tell you how it happened. <sighs> I said it before it happened. It is amazing, the flood of people with excuses and explanations. And now, you know, the Russians said, uh, YouGov, YouGov, yeah, YouGov took a poll that was reported to us off. 52% of Democrats polled act, actually believe the Russians hacked the numbers, not just false information, disinformation. They hacked the numbers, manipulated the numbers. 52% of Democrats believe they actually manipulated the numbers so Trump would win. Well, I love that the Democrats and the left have gotten so hot and bothered by the Ru- the Ruskies now. We could have yeah. really used them back during the Cold War. Yes, we could have. When Russia have? was, you know, when they were killing Americans in Vietnam, when you had the Stalin show trials, when the, they're forcing Hungarians to eat their shoes and, and starving yeah. Ukrainians to death. Oh, no, they were all for the Ru- Ruskies oh, yeah. back then. Oh, yeah. Now they won't let gays march down, you know, Moscow Square, and and oh, they don't get on the fighting side of the left on that. And remember, remember, Romney was calling the '80s. You know, they wanted their foreign policy back because Romney just didn't understand all this. And I love seeing. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to watch. It's what a business to be in. Ann Coulter, thank you, my dear. I greatly appreciate you being on, and I hope we get a chance to cross paths. I hope to see you at CPAC. It's been a while. Yes, perhaps now that Trump has won, Trump and I will not have to boycott this year. <laughs> I hope not. I want to see you there. And thank you. Thanks good, for everything you do. Good to talk to you, Kirby. All right, thanks so much, Ann. Have a great day.